I must thank uh, the director, Institute of Wood Science and Technology, and uh, of course, my great friend, uh, Dr. Arun Kumar for uh, having me on board. Uh, I have been asked to make a presentation on improvement and utilization of Melia Dubia and Melina Arboria. In fact, both the species are very close to my heart. And uh, therefore, I would, uh, I'm sure that I would be justifying inclusion of me as uh, a speaker. Yeah. In case of uh, tree improvement, a uh, little bit of basic is that, you know, application of genetic principles or tools to increase, uh, you know, value of a tree crop or to enhance the economic returns using wood and wood products by realizing various kind of variations we get is nothing but is actually tree improvement. It has different stages. Selection perhaps is considered to be one of the most important uh, stages as good parents contribute a lot in entire process of genetic improvement. Analysis of genetic variations and genetic diversity is equally important. I feel more important than that is what kind of adoption we take out of that genetic variation and use it for commercial programs as well as further breeding. We have, uh, we have to have a very highly functional uh, conservation strategy so that the genetic resources which are invaluable can be kept as well as utilized for uh, commercial deployments. We need to have, of course, a very efficient uh, propagation technique. And most importantly, we need to adopt certain cultivars out of whole process for commercialization. This is a basic framework any geneticist or a breeder uses for uh, tree improvement program, which starts, as I said uh, in the previous slide, selection is one of the most important and basic program. Then we'll have to go for, uh, you know, developing different, different repositories. We need to have different uh, production populations. And we need to, at one or some point of time, also go for uh, hybridization so that, you know, the new recombinants are brought in and they are utilized for commercial cultivation. This is a very simple example. Let's start with, you know, green revolution, perhaps each one of us is aware what it has contributed. Today we are self-sufficient in food grains. Uh, I feel uh, owing to, owing to uh, green revolution. I will just talk about two or three crops and then go straight away with forestry. To begin with, in during 1950-51, the productivity of rice in our whole of the country was about 20.58 uh, metric ton. Today, it has increased by 363, uh, you know, times. I'm sorry, 3.63 times. And today we have this is the data for 2010-2011, because for 2020-2021 is about to be released very shortly. Uh, increased about uh, three, three and uh, in 3.63 times. Let's look at wheat. The productivity increased by 11 times, 11 and a half times rather. The oil seeds, five times. Total as a whole, if we take about all, all food grains, the productivity has increased from 1950 to 2010, 2011 by 3.75 times. On the other hand, look at uh, three most important forestry species I would speak. Though the tree improvement programs have been started for, I mean, have been going on for various tree species, including Tectona grandis, Delvosia shishu, Melina arborea, different type of eucalypts, pines, acacias, gazorinas, poplars, and so on and so forth. Let's take two indigenous, uh, I mean, sorry, one indigenous and two exotics. Eucalyptus triticornis, for example, in India, the productivity is when we raise through seedlings, it's four to five metric, uh, meter cube per hectare per year. There are certain problems from uh, some of the private industries. The productivity has increased to about 20 meter cube per hectare per year. However, look at, uh, you know, productivity of Brazil. The average productivity, achievable product productivity is 40 to 50 meter cube per hectare per year. There are close, I am human to understand very well the literature is available, which have as high as 110 meter cube per hectare per year. So if we compare with that, I feel our eucalyptus program nowhere close by. 
Tecuna Grandis. Uh, the productivity of Indian Tecuna Grandis is two to three liter cube per hectare per year. Go to Thailand, it's as high as, high as uh, 10 to 12. Populous deltoides. The productivity of uh, very recently released, uh, unofficially released clone of uh, popular, uh, it's called uh, WF18 and 1110, is about 23.5 or and, and 25.10 uh, uh, respectively. However, in US, the productivity is as high as 50 meter cube per hectare per year. What I'm trying to say is that some of the species, indigenous species, which have been introduced from our country and gone to a small country like Thailand, for example, teak, the productivity has gone high as, as high as about three times uh, than that of, that, of, that of the eucalyptus. Similar is the case with the exotics, whereas in other countries, some of the exotics are doing very well. But in our, in our country, I feel there's a long, long way to go at. But look, 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 there are three or four uh, terms perhaps we would have uh, encountered. Uh, Dr. Ashwat, other one, 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 uh, I don't, I'm sorry to stop you, uh, interfere here. Even yes. your previous slides, you were talking about the, the productivity of India and abroad. It is yeah. purely of the genetic improvement or it is something to do with the, the climatic conditions. There are, there are, uh, you know, when we say tree improvement, actually tree improvement consists of three important factors. One, what is the basically the genetic constitution of a tree? Number two, what kind of silvicultural inputs we have given? And of course, third one is the climatic factor. So when the total productivity comes into the, uh, you know, uh, uh, consideration, it is these three factors co contribute and contribute uh, very significantly. Perhaps in the slides, uh, later I'm going to uh, discuss with you. I feel all these three would be discussed in a, in a uh, uh, smaller or a larger way. Thank you, sir. thank you. Yeah. So there are three, four terms which perhaps uh, matter a lot. Provenance, we say the genetic productivity is about 5%. I mean, genetic gain is about 5%. Plus trees, the gain varies from five to 7%. Seed production areas, I feel this is minimum unit of improvement, improvement tree improvement is seed production area. The gain is as high as five to 10%. Clonal seed orchards, five to 20%. The 16% has been realized in many of the crops in India. Seedling seed orchards, 10 to 12, uh, 15%. Clonally stock for that matter, is uh, as high as 25 to 30%. Only thing is, uh, when we say about clonally stock, this is one time. This is one time gain and you have to therefore, I mean, this is kind of intermittent gain of a long term tree improvement program using the seed source. So though this is, uh, this is, uh, this looks to be very high, but it is very short term, very intermittent. We have to something like, uh, you know, a train, say, for example, if it starts from uh, Jammu Tavi and goes to Kanyakumari, a passenger boards at Kanyakumari, I'm sorry, uh, Jammu Tavi and uh, you know leaves the train at ludhiana another one you know boards it at ludhiana and gets down at nagpur so the clonal stock is something like this it is an intermittent gain of a long term tree increment program ah uh, i will not go much into uh, yeah see this is how i was talking about parents when we, when we discuss about parents, the gene and gene frequency is a very, very important aspect. What happens? You basically skew towards the positive, uh, uh, you know, side of it by selecting few good individuals and rejecting majority of them. The gene frequency changes and it changes in a way that either the selection could be, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, it is unidirectional. And there are certain uh, selection processes which is which, which are additional uh, There's something which was there's something that is example in a negative cell. Uh, say for example, Aculea agolocha, we call it agar uh, agar tree. It is grown in a part of uh, northeast. The susceptible trees are selected for the very simple purpose because the wood is to be infected by an insect first, and second the infection by a fungus. So here is a negative selection. And once that negative kind of selection happens, the frequency will be increasing in a negative side. I'm sorry, the slide is, uh, yeah, yeah. 
it will be uh, you know improving in a negative side but when the selection is made for a for a positive trait the 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 the, the movement of whole gene frequency would be in a positive side i'm just giving an example of uh, melina arborea where you know from entire northeast and parts of west bengal 119 trees uh, plus trees were selected and these plus trees were really subjected to various kind of uh, evaluation tests one of such test i would say is a progeny test progeny test is nothing but progeny is uh, progeny evaluation is a method of evaluating the performance of the parents it's other way around if we in, in in our own cases if we feel i would say my son is like this or her his daughter is like this but basically uh in our case it goes on my son and his son and his daughter and uh, so and so forth but the fact is progeny test is one test which necessarily evaluates the performance of the parents so if the children are not of that good caliber or good quality the performance of the parents perhaps is not of that quality or i would say the quality of the parents is poor therefore the progeny is uh not that good however if you sir the question uh, is the one you ask is dealt over here very well d lickey a very well known scientist of uh, denida he has come up with this theory and the theory is 70 2010 70 is an environmental impact if we take the performance of a tree as 100 out of that 70% contribution comes from the environment the genotype and environmental interaction all together works for to 20% 20% and the whole total genotypic impact would be just 10% let's please remember one thing the 10% has brought that small component of 10% has brought green revolution in our country all genetics we play is just around the 10% 70% is the environment we can never forget when we work on genetic improvement the impact of the environment Empra, em, uh, 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 environment is equally important rather i would say seven times more important than environment uh, than genotype so growing a genotype across the locations or across the environments is not going to serve the purpose what is going to serve the purpose a very good combination of environment and genotype and that becomes genotype into environmental interaction i feel this is this is one philosophy most of the geneticists work on that work on this g into e i will i will go a little uh, ahead of it say for example in in tree improvement let's let's corroborate that philosophy of genotype environment and genotypic genotype into environmental interaction in forest trees we have conducted on many of the uh, you know uh, progeny trials in many of the species it has unfortunately been a case either these you know uh, these uh, progeny trials have discontinued by some or other reasons major reason is the administrative reason because trees are very very long term uh, you know programs and often we feel like overnight some results could be gained or overnight these progeny trials can really serve the purpose but i would say because all of you are in a very responsible position tomorrow or day after tomorrow you would be really looking into these programs so i would say the genetic programs should have a different kind of thought process whereby these trials have to go for a long term the short term evaluations perhaps a monthly basis or two monthly basis are not going to be very useful they are going to be useful but not very useful in uh, in trees they are they have to be you know decades long program two decades long program and in some cases even i uh, you know 100 years or 200 years long program and then only the real genetic work of a tree comes out and can be used but that doesn't mean that a program has to wait for 100 years the short term ways the mid middle term ways whereby these genetic gains can be utilized can be deployed in the future there are cases where irregular data recording is done but i feel that is that gets compensated when the final data really really overtakes everything and majority of the cases we have seen 
that you know the best provenances are not utilized to the level they should have been utilized and we have really not come to the land races except few species i would say the eucalypts and of course uh, casuarina uh, the land races majority of the things which have been uh, particularly exotics have not really come to the space i, I would say there are certain uh, you know tree species where it has been done very methodically eucalypts malayana arborea casuarina tree i feel all these three three four species some systematic program is going on but i feel still we need to go in, in a long way there are majority of the programs which are half seeds when i say half seeds let's put it in a simple term where only one parent is known as you know a, a sector like forestry where the gestation period is so high 10 years 12 years 15 years 20 years by the time one or two cycle comes i feel the whole lifetime of a scientist or a researcher Two to three cycles can only be possible, and therefore majority of times we have been working on half seeds. I feel this is the time we move further. We move further and work on full seeds. When I say full seeds, it is artificial hybridizers, where both the parents are known. Half seed means we, it's it's as simple as that. Half of a sibling is known. That is only one parent is known, and full seed means when both the parents are known. In case of hybrid uh, uh, artificial hybrids. We know both the parents, so I think this is the time that we work on uh, full seeds to really gain that heterosis, the gain, uh, you know, I would say very high degree of gain suddenly, which is possible through hybridization. We have often been talking about uh, carbon sequestration. We have often been talking about what the role forestry has got uh, in many of the aspects, in particular in agroforestry. I have, though I have, I have. The least knowledge of uh, carbon sequestration and, of course, uh, mitigations and things are like that. But only thing, simple thing I know is that agroforestry has been contributing substantially now. In fact, after uh, 1996 decision of Honorable Supreme Court of India, it is agroforestry which are meeting our requirements. And more the trees we grow, higher the car carbon we are going to sequester within a tree. Higher is the rate of a growth, uh, rate of the growth of a tree. Higher will be the carbon sequestration. So I feel by one bullet we we really target many uh, many aspects. Once we are into tree improvement, and systematic programs are are uh, you know increased. Let's take a little bit because I have been asked to concentrate more on Melaina arborea and uh, Lilia dubia. I would just go with simple uh, you know few. Uh, uh, facts because I did not want it to be very technical and uh, I just wanted this presentation presentation to be understood from a you know practical point of view. In Melaina arborea, a very simple thing, the flower color. If you look these five photographs, these five photographs have five different colors. You could see there are deep yellow, there are purple, there's a mixed color or something like that. And you may ask me why these colors have any impact on this. But look at the next picture. See, when you have this kind of uh, either, uh, you know, this yellowish purple uh, kind of flowers, the seed setting is very high. You could just see simple color of the flower has got an influence on the seed setting. On the other hand, when you have this dull color of flowers, this is, this is, what, this is what the seed setting happens to be. So one could really guess when one works very systematically on a tree, loves working on the tree one can really find out a small factor a small factor of variability or genetic diversity or i would say point of the diversity makes a big difference in a net outcome and this is one a very simple plain example which i love uh, presenting before uh, when i started working in 2003 in milia dubia and i was asked to make a survey of the field these are four photographs, though I had taken many photographs. These four photographs I had, uh, you know, screened out and I have put them. One of the photographs is for the uh, is of the pure plantations of Melia. One was taken from roadside plantation. I went to, you know, uh, different uh, uh, areas and there are certain uh, agroforestry plantations developed with that. And there are certain irrigation plant, irrigated plantations of Melia. Then you could just see 
uh, these four, four photographs and please remember these photographs for, for a while. Of course, I would not let you forget these photographs. So these are the two photographs which I had shown you earlier. So this is the kind of stuff we were having when we started this program in 2000, uh, you know, two and 2003. But then we started the genetic improvement program. Today you could just see uh, what kind of straight bowl we have got. You have to compare with these two photographs of unimproved plantation agroforestry practices of 2002 and 2003. You could just see what kind of clear bowl we have got and what kind of crown we have got. I have, I have tried to, you know, I have just given gene and gene frequency, how it matters. Then I have given you full slide, few slides. And now I'm just trying to put all these things in perspective. The three stages, if I, if I go for uh, so far, if I summarize it, there are, you know, base populations, there are check populations, and there are selective populations or plus genes. If I put them in a perspective and find out the base population to check population or to check trees, a straight pair one can make a difference about 33%. I'm sorry, uh, 12%. And from check trees to plus trees, if seriously, the plus trees have been done using scientific techniques. The difference is as high as 33%. In a way, from base population to check tree, it's a straight way 48%. I mean, you would still think roughly double the productivity can be can be achieved. And look at the selection differential. It shifts to about uh, 10.19, which is substantially, substantially high. So this is what is the, I would say, power of the selection but when i say power of the selection that cannot be done by sitting uh, in a corner or standing on the roadside and saying select this tree select that tree reject that tree it has to be done scientifically when i say scientifically it has to have a very very systematic program where you have a good base population the check trees are selected very scientifically and the plus trees are made out of those things very, very scientifically. And once that happens, I can give you a guarantee a tree improvement program is not going to be a failure. It is never going to be a failure. Let's go ahead a little more. These are the kind of select, uh, you know, plus trees we have got in uh, Lilia Dubia. I mean, just look at those three, four photographs which I had shown you in the beginning and look what kind of trees we have got. These are the, these are the trees which are existing in the natural populations. These are the trees which are existing in our stands. It's only thing that we'll have to screen them, we'll have to analyze them, and and, uh, and and interpretation is to be done in a way that you know it gives very very clear indicative results so that it can be utilized for the purpose of commercial forestry. Just look at one minor aspect I have uh, I have uh, got here through these uh, photographs. There are five genotypes. You could just see the kind of fishers you have got. One might think that these fishers are very natural kind of, kind of things, but might not really impact the genotype in a longer way. But I can tell you, they have a very, very high degree of influence on the uh, you know, final product. Say so this kind of uh, fishers, for example, these two, they are very easy to in peeling, whereas these kind of things are not very easy in peeling. So when you look at uh, these different genotypes from commercial point of view, these are the kind of genotypes which would be per preferred in the industry. But these are the kind of genotypes which would go well with you know, timber uh, industry or furniture industry. So a small factor, the kind of uh, small units are going to make a big difference, which I feel needs to be uh, you know, analyzed properly, needs to be calibrated properly and I feel needs to be recommended very well so that finally when it goes to the goes into the you know um, uh, for larger or uh, you know commercial production such factors can be taken because ultimately it has to go for the commercial cultivation and when we go for the commercial cultivation we must know before we go for a plantation whether that particular plantation is for uh, plywood is for pulpwood or is for timber so the the moment and product is known to us or end use is known to us i feel our strategy for the strategy for the planting needs to be changed let's go further on variability these are the kind of stones we get in 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 Lilia dubia i feel i am not required to explain what kind of uh, you know variability it has got 
you have wrinkled uh, you know stones uh, fruits i'm sorry you have round ones you have very thick ones we have thinner ones we have smaller ones you have different kind of uh, you know fruits cut see my friend uh, this slide uh, dr arun uh, kumar who has who has really analyzed different kind of uh, uh, you know uh, fruits you have got uh, the oblong type the peas they are you know different kind of fruits now let's go for that you 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 uh, you know depulp it and then you come out uh, and and see the stones and these stones are equally uh, you know amazing to have a high degree of variability there are ones which are bold there are ones which are uh, you know very small there are ones which are very long type of thing they are round they are ob i mean all kind of uh, stones we have got now when we started this program uh, uh, in 2002 2003 one of uh, rather few of my friends warned me and said that look here you are uh, taking a species which has a very bold this in south india and not more than 40 45% in uh, north india then we started working upon that and then i found that you know it is all environmental factors which really uh, are matter which which have mattered a lot in the sense the people were taking those fruits and then they were you know growing them and what happens is that the, the pulp of these fruits is very rich uh, and and very thick as well so by the when you when you grow it in the soil first the pulp gets decomposed and in the process of decompose because it's very rich in proteins and uh, carbohydrates a lot of fungus attacks it and when uh, when the, the the seed germinates what happens the available fungus kills it so it is an external factor which had been affecting its germination rather than an internal factor so we went further we developed this process of uh, you know removing of uh, pulp or rather depulping and then we found that this 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 uh, you know seed can be kept the viability as as high as 3 to 2 uh, to 3 years or so and each of the stone what i had shown there has got five to seven locules and each of the locule has one seed so if you provide good environment it has no nothing the, the genetics has nothing to do uh, at any job here it is the environmental factor which you if you provide proper environment you can get as many as seven seedlings out of one stone on an average you get about 353% of the germination in terms of a stone then you look here if i if i can show you this is one uh, one stone where you have got four to five uh, seedlings here is another one here is another one let's go further thus uh, you know stones where you get one seedling There are stones where you get two seedlings. There are stones where you get three seedlings. You get four. You get five. You get six. And I have got in seven seedlings out of one uh, stone. Again, I would say it is all depending on uh, the environment in which you are growing these uh, stones. The the way you are really harvesting these uh, uh, seedlings from the nursery and transplanting it. Uh, that that makes a big difference and using this technique today it is routinely possible that in a small nursery of a farai we have been making about 2.5 to 3 lakh seedlings every year and there are four laborers who do this work entire work it has been you know i would say systematically done so now i feel the germination is no more an issue let's look various other factors of the species the specific gravity it's a very very uh, you know important factor in few of the genotypes we have uh, we have analyzed 13 of the genotypes it has been it has varied from 0.33 to 0.5 in fact my uh, friend arun has told me uh, i'm i'm not sure whether it was arun or somebody else that in karnataka there is a farmer who has got 0.62 i mean look at the amount of uh, amount of variability in terms of specific uh, gravity exists that gives you an indication that the species is multiple per uses it can go very well with pulp it can go very well with plywood and it has a wonderful timber and let me really make one more uh, 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 you know a point clear and that is in india we have uh, two 
very big sectors, rather three very big sectors of uh, plywood. One is in Haryana called Yamuna Nagar, another is Rampur in Uttar Pradesh, and of course in South. So majority of the times we are getting pays worth about 5,050 crore, uh, 5,500 crore, 1,000 crore rupees every year. This is one species which has a high potential to get a phase, uh, which is very, very profitable. We also worked upon the synthase, both radial and pangean, and we found this is in a permissible limit. The set food heart food ratio is wonderful. I think the ratio is about 20, 80%, 80% the heart food, 20%, 13 to 20%, rather 13 to 19% is the uh, set food, which is, I suppose, a very, very uh, you know, uh, good ratio. When we started this program, some of uh, you know people said that it has a very serious issue of uh, splitting ends. When you cut, the cut ends split and split very heavily. This is these are the two lots we kept on watching for about uh, two years after harvesting. And I, I I don't need to speak anything. You can just see yourself. Then we made different kind of plunk. We started working on its end products, and we wanted to really find out specific genotypes for specific end uses. And this is where we are, uh, uh, you know, peeling it. The veneering is quite easy, quite good. And the color kind of color we have got, uh, the, the, the industry owner where we did uh, this kind of, this, uh, you know, peeling, he was very happy and he said, uh, you know, it can go in uh, phase very well. Of course, the scientific experimentation for phase are still on, we have not really, Though I'm given to understand in South, it is being used for phase. In North, we have really still uh, still been uh, not conclusive, the kind of phase, the strength, the texture, and so on and so forth. So these are the factors we worked upon. This is uh, this is uh, experimental uh, experimentation on uh, fly. And then we found different kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, different uh, fly, uh, fly from different uh, genotypes. We also had, uh, you know, some uh, timber experimentation. One of my friends using different techniques to uh, densify the wood, and he has been very successful to take this uh, density to as high as 0.9. Uh, though the experiment is, is still uh, not concluded, but I'm very sure in days to come, this species is really, really going to be very, very good species in terms of molded furnitures or uh, uh, the kind of, uh, the kind of, uh, High density uh, would be required for uh, such furnitures. Let's go for uh, you know field trials. These are certain uh, progeny trials we had. Uh, we had uh, we have been conducting. You could just see the early growth of the species. You just could, can see. And uh, as as somebody asked, how the environment is going to make a difference? I would just give uh, an example. This particular genotype, it is splits into two to two to three uh, you know um, uh, branches after one and a half, four, uh, one and a half or two, two, two uh, meters. And all the trees of the genotype, this genotype, like this, tend to get split it into three to four uh, branches. There are others, uh, you know, which, which, which keep very straight, you could just see. And one over here, you could see these are, the, though the species by and large is uh, full of self-pruning ability, but there are certain genotypes, which you can just see over here, that these are the trees which are not, uh, uh, you know, showing any self pruning ability, and this is what, uh, you know, you get uh, you get in in about one and a half years time or so, so straight, so simple to really uh, judge about. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, one of such uh, uh, you know trial in Hoshiarpur and Chaksarka, very close by to uh, uh, India Pakistan border. This is in Latur, Maharashtra. This is one of the release, uh, uh, you know, varieties of FRI, which this farmer had taken. And I see the kind of bowl it makes at the, uh, you know, this is just uh, five and a half years old uh, Malana Arborean Haryana, which is not considered to be a, uh, you know, favorable uh, stake. So far was not considered to be favorable stake. Now it is really gaining and gaining the grounds very thick and fast. And this is the kind of uh, you know genotypes you get. These are the, of course uh, germplasm being made, and then you know uh, other factor counts. You know once a genotype has been found, there could be two ways to uh, to to propagate it: either using seed root or the cloner root. 
seed root uh, say for example half seeds we have been working majority of the time if uh, unknown uh, parent is of uh, poor quality i feel there is a lot of uh, segregation takes place and you will get different kind of populations and i think the whole purpose really gets defeated and therefore it is important to use the clonal forestry and that's where the clonal forestry as i said in the beginning uses uh, you know it gives you as high as uh, 25 to 30% genetic gain it gives you because both uh, you know additive and non additive gene impacts are transferable using uh, because this is this is a heterogeneous population they can be they can be just propagated as they exist and they become true to mother and therefore the gain is little high but these are the populations which need to be changed very frequently and these are certain uh, uh, you know tools this is a very interesting a uh, small uh, uh, you know um, uh, study i am just uh, mentioning though it is not conclusive but i thought i will share it with you and that is you know when you when you get uh, in field particularly i feel it is going to help you a lot nowadays we must be you know all of our all Which is in hold, in catching hold the culprits, uh, different kinds of crimes, right from technology to human being. Uh, uh, you know, these are the these are the kind of crimes where uh, forensics are playing a big role. We just thought that the same principle of uh, uh, forensics should also be used used in uh, wood forensics, and using the melina uh, uh, melia dubia, we thought let's 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 try to do. how we can how we can really apply those tools over here and then because wood is our final product so we started uh, you know experimenting with wood then we make uh, we made some uh, uh, you know we cut some wood from some of the trees of our experiments and then small chips were made these chips were run through uh, uh, you know a machine and fine powder was made and then dna was uh, obtained out of it out of this and then you know Uh, 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 we try to find out whether we can really have these uh, wood DNA forensics for wood, both with the soft wood and the hard wood, or as indicate with the soft wood and all as indicate with the hard wood. And we found both these woods are sufficiently okay to give us give to give us uh, an indication the uh, the uh, source of the wood. source of the tree from where say for example it would have been cut in a in an illicit uh, manner or would have been theft so this can be done this is a very very pilot kind of study once you know we do uh, uh, you know multiply using the artificial uh, uh, tree improvement kind of uh, techniques and those varieties which have been released once these varieties are deployed in the field catching hold of illegal uh, you know cutting of wood would be very very easy using using this technique and 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 therefore uh, we are uh, we are very sure that in days to come dna forensics is going to play a very big role not only in milia but i think across the species particularly valued species like uh, teak uh, centenum album maybe red sanders and so many other species i need not to uh, uh, talk few limited species the tool can be used very well uh, one of the problems which uh, which uh, you know we face with the insects so we we uh, you know trying to manipulate uh, uh, you know genetics for uh, uh, for insect uh, uh, i would say control uh, this is uh, one insect called calopepla and this is a very classical example very close to my heart and very simple to understand yet very so i will discuss with you this is the insect which really has a very very devastating impact on uh, melaina arborea uh, it's a deciduous tree so it naturally shades its leaves during uh, winters but this insect forces it to shade uh, its its uh, you know uh, leaves twice in the year other than uh, winter season so you can just see how much of the photosynthesis very limited photosynthesis are possible to be made because this insect eats away whole of the foliage and trees the tree would have nothing so the tree puts in a, in a way 
a lot of energy in uh, regenerating the leaves. Again, the insect comes. So this struggle goes on in, in those seven to eight months of, uh, of uh, foliage period where there's a big struggle between insect and the, and the tree. Just we, we went for about, uh, you know, it was 72 genotypes we analyzed and we found about 7% of the genotypes are highly resistant, 26 are moderately resistant, 44% uh, percent are moderately susceptible and 22% are highly susceptible. We wanted to know what is the causal organism. Well, I mean, what is the cause of the susceptibility and uh, the resistance? It is very simple. What we did is that on the lateral side, because this insect you will find would be on the lateral side of the leaf. So on the lateral side of the leaf, we started counting uh, uh, the number of hairs. And the ones which were highly susceptible had very few uh, hairs. It means the movement of the insect was so easy that it could move on the on the leaves and eat it at will. On the other hand, if you see on the on the right side, highly resistant genotypes had leaf hairs per millimeter square ranging from 35 to 80. So this was a physical barrier in the movement of the insect. So like human being, the insects are also very clever. Wherever there was a resistance, using I mean uh, through those hairs, these insects did not prefer those kind of uh, genotypes and therefore these genotypes saved themselves from the attack of the insect. Of course, there are chemical reasons also, but this is one of the very simple classical uh, example to show very small study how effective is this insect. And of course, this publication of mine won me an award as well. Uh, in Melia Dubia, a hybridization program was going on and I can tell you it's not easy. The tree grows to about uh, 29 to 30 meters in a span of about five to seven years, seven years, or eight years. And making hybrids over there is not all that easy. Nonetheless, we try to make some hybrids and you know study various parts of it. Just look the color of the flower. It 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 ranges dark purple, uh, dark purple to light purple, uh, light purple, and the whitest flower. Go further. Very very simple thing. You can just see the kind of sepals you have got. You have got uh, double sepal. There are there are three. There are four. There are up to eight. You have got. If you look at the you know length of the uh, pendicles, it's, it's very short. The medium, the length is also, and all these factors in your genetic improvement plays a big role. If you look at the number of petals, it ranges from four to nine. I mean, you can just see, you can divide them genotype to genotype. You can divide them uh, from parent to parent. Uh, look at the color of the external tube, and of course, uh, in 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 a pistil. Then uh, these are these are uh, microscopic uh, pictures of sepals, petal, pistil, and anther. And these these vary a lot from genotype to genotype. This is very interesting. This is a you know sequentially stage of uh, of uh, uh, you know uh, bud development. Uh, this is from day one to nine day, and this is a very very crucial factor when you when you make hybrid. And then this of course is a sequential opening of the flower. I would not much emphasize on that, but I will emphasize on that. When you make a hybrid, you need to decide when you have to do the emasculation. Emasculation is another, but this is you know bisexual flower. Removal of the male part from this uh, uh, you know bisexual flower is nothing but emasculation. So this flower, if I say uh, go further, these are the sequential where the stomatal tube are developed, the 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 pistil are developed. And uh, uh, what I was uh, trying to say is, I will I will explain this slide a little later. But uh, this is where you know we studied uh, uh, the genotypes using uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide, and we found uh, that you know there's a there's a uh, you know a high degree of receptivity, very high degree of receptivity. These are the pollens, and this is very interesting. This is what I wanted to explain. If you do not emasculate. If I have taken this this in a in a uh, different angle, and if you look, these are the anthers, and here is the here is the uh, you know female part of the flower. So if you do not remove these uh, you know male part from uh, a, a, a bisexual flower, what happens? These flower you know they mature, 
And as in the previous slide, I showed that this is highly, highly receptive uh, stigma. If you are not removing these parts from here, the anthers open uh, and the pollen is, uh, you know, busted and immediately the stigma gets pollinated. So what you need to do in this stage, in this stage, you will have to remove very well early, very early in the stage of the flower that you need to remove the male part. Otherwise, the self-pollination pollination takes place. And in fact, this is the reason why this species is so highly, uh, you know, self-pollinated because by the time the, 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 the flower opens, the pollination would have already taken place. And as I said, this is self, predominantly self-pollinated species. About 90 to 95 percent is the self-pollination, but 5 to 10 percent of the cross-pollination also takes place. And we found that B is an important element for uh, this uh, cross-pollination. I'll move further. So these are the basic studies, but I would say this is this is really taking nowhere. This is really taking us nowhere unless we take some material out of your research program for commercial deployment. And uh, the Ministry of Environment and Forest, uh, uh, rather I would say Ministry of Agriculture already had, a, uh, you know, uh, uh, I would say guideline that how the improved varieties are to be released for commercial uh, cultivation. Whereas in case of forestry, that was not there. So Ministry of Environment and Forestry 2008 developed those guidelines where the varieties can be released, varieties and clones can be released for, uh, for uh, commercial cultivation in forestry. And this is the procedure where there's a team uh, which goes to the field, verifies a document, a geneticist or a breeder submits, verifies those entries which are, uh, which are uh, you know, useful. And of course, uh, Dr. Arun Kumar is, was one of the very important member, though he's good friend of mine, but I never knew that he has a tape in, uh, in, in his pocket. So when I showed the genotype, he took out that book, which is, uh, which is there with him and took out the tape and measured it. He was very satisfied when the measurement was more than what I had given in the, in the record. And this is how it goes on. In the second stage, this is called Regional Variety Testing Committee. The committee really verifies the document as well as uh, the, or based on the report of the implementation team. And then finally, it goes for the Variety Leasing Committee. The Variety Leasing Committee is, uh, functions under the chairmanship of Director General Forest and Special Secretary of the Government of India, and those varieties uh, or clones which are found good are released. This is one of the factors. Uh, somebody had asked what the environment is going to do, what, what the role can have three kind of level of stability. Either they are stable or they are so we have to find those genotypes which are stable, whether stable in a smaller uh, region or stable across. So the ones which are stable for a region are released for, for that particular region. And the ones which are, uh, you know, stable across are, are uh, you know, um, released on, on that basis. I would just say this is, this is one, uh, you know, column. Uh, I mean, the genotypes which will be falling here would be productive. But we'll have to see the genotypes which fall on this black line because this is these are the genotypes are in and around that line they are stable so we have to find out these genotypes which are productive as well as stable these genotypes for example are not productive these are the genotypes though they are productive but not stable they, the the performance of these genotypes will change the moment environment changes and therefore sir the environment plays a big role as i said in the beginning so these are the 10 genotypes which we had uh, released sometimes ago in 2017. These are the regions for which they were released. And here is the performance. Uh, one, of the, one of the released uh, uh, genotype called Baumaki had 39.9 uh, meter cube per hectare per year productivity. Cities has 33.43. The Mega has 26.73. Versa has 37.11. Sharad has this is the highest, of course, 55.83 meter cube per hectare per year. Karthik has 33.71. Dave with 24.36. Ritu with 23.19. Amar with 31.10. And Shashi with 40.41 meter cube per hectare per year. And 
we have uh, we have been fortunate enough to really have sufficient material supplied uh, supplying to different uh, people uh, users and the seed of these varieties is available at the rate of 5000 per kg and planting material at the rate of 25 rupees per plant very recently this year we have developed a, a multiplication um, a non exclusive agreement with the Rimco seedlings which is a subsidiary of uh, ITC limited and uh, they buy us uh, seed from us uh, at the rate of rupees 1000 per kg and they pay us royalty at the rate of uh, 1 rupee 50 paisa per plant so with this uh, I thank you all uh, for uh, for uh, listening me very patiently. Thank you. Thank you very much.